morning, everybody. Welcome back to another Raincoast Field School at home. You're here with me, Taylor, and I'm so excited to be with you this week because we're finally getting off the land. We are jumping into the intertidal zone this week as our topic. We're going to talk about tides. We are going to talk about different zonations, and we're also going to go explore some tide pools and see some awesome organisms that live there. Welcome back to all of our Yuki and Wiccaninish elementary kids. We're stoked that you are here to join us, as well to any visitors from any other region. We are happy that you are here with us today. So let's jump in the field and get to that learning. Whoa, Taylor. What you doing? That's an insane amount of books. Looks like you're trying to learn about the ocean. Yeah, you got it. So I'm from Manitoba and the ocean is so foreign to me. So I'm really trying to do my research and learn as much about it as I possibly can. These books are awesome. Steph, did you know that there's this zone called the intertidal zone? It has all these crazy little alien looking like creatures. There's so much there that I've never even seen before. And here in Tofino and Ukulele, there's these things called tide pools. And we can go and see these in real life. These ones are my favorite. These are what I'm going to try and look for. They're called anemones. Oh, Taylor, you have so much to learn. Those are anemones. Don't worry. I'll show you all there is to know about the intertidal. Nice. Let's go check it out. Yeah. What the... My friend Johnny said that if I come down to Cox, I will see some really cool, awesome intertidal stuff. I don't see anything right now. All I see are lame barnacles. What gives? Taylor, we're experiencing a high tide right now. You gotta come back at low tide. Oh. Let me help you out. So, to help Taylor understand the intertidal zone, we need to first learn how and why the tides move each day. The water on the Earth's surface is affected by the gravitational pull by the moon and sun. The moon has the strongest effects on our tides because it's closest to the Earth. The moon circulates around the Earth once every month, and this changes the time of day when the tide is high and low by a few minutes each day. The moon and sun are not strong enough to pull the Earth out of shape like a piece of toffee, but they do pull at the oceans, and as a result, the ocean bulges and creates tides. The moon pulls the oceans towards it on the side of the earth that's facing the moon. Here, these regions will experience a high tide. The earth rotates around its axis once a day. So there will be a period each day where we experience a high tide because we are facing the moon. However, we get two periods of high tide each day and two periods of low. This is because the spinning earth creates a second high tide period on the opposite side of the earth as the moon. And this is due to the centrifugal force, the force created by the spinning of the earth. And so it's because of the moon and the sun that we get these high and low tides each day. And it's that area between the high tide and the low tide that creates the intertidal zone. Let's come back in a few hours to check out Cox Bay during low tide. All right, guys, we are so, so lucky this week because we get Stefania Gurgopa to help us along. So she is one of our Raincoast employees, and she's a marine biologist. So she's an expert when it comes to all things intertidal. Everybody, say hello to Steph. Hey, guys. Oh, hey, Steph. Right on. We are so excited to have you out here with us today. Hey, Steph, what's your favorite intertidal species you hope to see today? Happy sea stars. They're so pretty uh, and colorful. I love them. All right, let's go find a sea star for Steph. We are back and it's low tide. Take a look around. Right where we're standing today was covered in water, but the water is now way out on its low tide. And look at all of the organisms we can see. Check it out. So, can you guys see all these different coloring layers on our rocks? Do you guys see those? They're called biobats. Let's take a little bit closer look at them and explain what's going on. 
let's check out this wall. It's going to help us understand how the tides influence the plant and animal communities found here in our intertidal zone. And as Steph mentioned, remember the intertidal zone is the area that's exposed at low tide like it is here, but becomes covered with seawater at high tide. Bands of different plant and animal life on our rocks are called biobands, and they have communities of plants and animals that have the same tolerances to different stresses of the intertidal zone. So those that are higher up in our bands, like these barnacles and different lichens, are going to be able to be exposed out of water for longer periods of the day. But as we move down the rocks, down in our biobands, we encounter things such as anemones, that need to be covered for the majority of the day and are only going to be exposed during those really low tides. What you doing, Taylor? Well, I'm doing my Rain Coast Challenge this week, so I've been tasked with drawing the different tidal zones. About those bio bands, well, each one is actually its own tidal zone, so come take a look. So, if you guys can check it out, we have at the very top is called our spray zone. So right up there where those trees are. And this is area that's never ever going to be covered with seawater. However, it does have all this salt spray coming off. So it's called our spray zone. And then as we move down the rock, we have our high tide zone. So that's gonna be mostly exposed during the day because it's all, like only covered at really, really high periods. And we're gonna find things like lichens growing there and a little bit of barnacle. And as we move down, we have our mid-tide zone. We're gonna have things like mussels, have different types of seaweeds growing like rockweed, as well as more barnacles. And the lowest area on the rock is called our low tide zone. And this is where those cool starfish are gonna be and sea anemones. And these guys need to be exposed or covered for the majority of the day. Let's dive into these a little bit more. So let's talk first about that spray zone. So all of those green living trees, different salal that you see up there, they're never ever covered with seawater. If they were, they would die. However, species like Sitka spruce and shore pine are dominant tree species. And these are really, really important for our ecosystem. They kind of guard our coastlines and they comb the salt out of the air with their really prickly needles. And because of this, all the other tree species like hemlock and cedar that are found more in our forests are able to thrive because that sea salty air is removed. Hey Steph! Oh, hey. hey, right on! We are just talking about our different tidal zones. Could you help us out with the high tide? For sure. So our high tide zone is right here. So these are the ones, the animals, that don't like to be covered in seawater all day. So we got some barnacles, some limpets. If you guys put these animals in a tank of seawater, they'd actually try and climb out, at least the ones I can, like the limpets. The barnacles are kind of stuck where they are. So the next one, as we move down this rock face, we have our mid-tide zone. So it's exposed during like half the period of the day, but it's also covered for half. So let's check out some of the organisms here. We have a lot of different seaweeds growing. These are some rock weeds that we have as well. We can kind of see that our barnacles are still present, but we're also starting to get mussels at this layer. Pretty cool, hey? And as we drop down from the mid-tide, we enter the low-tide zone. All right, Steph, what's going on? So this zone has a lot more squishy things like anemones. These are green surf anemones and pink tip anemones all in here and lots of big mussels and gooseneck barnacles. It's a really diverse zone uh, and this area is covered with water most of the day so you find a lot of these more soft-bodied animals. Alright Steph, I'm so excited. Let's go tide pooling. I cannot wait to see some more organisms. Hold on Taylor. Before we go exploring, we should really talk about uh, this environment and how tough these organisms are. Alright Steph, let's do it. Okay, so one of the factors that they got to deal with is the salinity changes. So guys, the amount of salt that they're dealing with on a regular basis. So at high tide when they're covered, they got all this salty ocean. But as the tide recedes and they're out exposed, where'd all the salt go? So some of these species have adaptations to help them kind of keep a more general level of salt throughout the day. So mussels are able to close up really, really tightly and even hold a little bit of salt water inside. And the barnacles, 
have things called trap doors that kind of do the same thing. They, they're able to hold a bit of that ocean water while they're exposed during the day. So another thing these organisms have to deal with is changes in temperature. Our ocean water is pretty cold, but when these organisms are exposed to the air, they also have to deal with the hot sun. All right, Steph, so how do they deal with these temperature changes? So they have a few different adaptations. Uh, algaes, for example, some of them can actually dry up almost completely and then rehydrate when the tide comes back in, so they're pretty resilient. Other things will try and grow on the shady sides of rocks, so it's always good when you're out intertidal exploring to look on the undersides of rocks to get a lot more diversity in those spaces where the sun doesn't shine as much. So another extreme factor that these species have to deal with are the crazy waves. The wave action in the intertidal is insane. Think of those gnarly winter waves that we have here. So some of the species have adaptations to help them really latch on to things. So mussels have bissel threads and it's kind of like all these little threads that help them anchor onto the rock. And barnacles actually cement on, so they're really, really hard to get off the rocks. Have you guys ever tried to peel them off? We also have things like sea stars that have two feet that suction onto rocks. Uh, what else? Also, of course, all the different shell species are really hard, right? So they can withstand those pounding waves. Taylor, what about algae? Oh yeah, so algae are able to anchor onto rocks due to their hold fast. It almost looks like a root-like structure, but it actually attaches to rocks to really hold them onto. Doesn't this look pretty crowded? There's a lot of stuff growing here. And that's because there's a competition for space. So you can see that this isn't really any exposed rock. We've got anemones here, barnacles here. Up there we've got mussels uh, and more gooseneck barnacles. Real estate is at a premium in the intertidal zone. One of the last things that these organisms have to deal with is predators. Just like these guys. The predators help open up space for new animals to move in. Can you guys think of any land-based predators that these organisms would have to deal with? Dwellers. Well, land or air dwellers like birds, also things like raccoon and mink, any of these small vertebrates, fuzzy little creatures, they like to pick uh, marine organisms off the rocks. Also bears and even coastal wolves will eat in the intertidal zone. Wow, Steph, I'm so intrigued. Tell me more. Well, I'll tell you a cool fact. A lot of birds, like seagulls and crows, they'll try and get into these animals, like mussels, that are really hard to get into that shell. So what they'll do is they'll actually use gravity to help open up the shells. They'll pick them up, fly really high, and drop those shells down to the ground, and then they'll break open and they'll have an easy snack for the birds. Okay, Steph, so I'm assuming that if there's land pred predators, there's also some predators living in the water, right? Yeah, for sure. Things like these anemones are predators and sea stars. What? Sea stars are predators? Yeah, they're like the apex predators of the intertidal. Like cheetahs almost. Whoa! I can't wait any longer. We gotta go intertidaling. You're talking about sea stars being predators? Let's go. Let's go. Let's go see some cool stuff. Alright Steph, let's go jump in the tide pool and see what we can see. Taylor, no! Taylor, no! Taylor, that's not a rock, that's an anemone. What? Yeah. That looks like a rock. Whoa, you're right, Steph. So before we go intertidaling, we need to go through the do's and don'ts of being in the intertidal zone. So do flip over rocks to see what's underneath, but make sure you put them back after you're done. Don't take things home. Taylor? Do use your pinky to touch the species. Don't aggressively rip things off the walls. So do be careful when you're walking on rocks. The algaes are slippery, the anemones are slippery, but the barnacles are grippy. Don't lose track of time and disregard the changing tides.
a sea star. Cool, so this is a purple ochre star and it's stuck to this rock with two feet. They're like little suction cups that uses to stick onto that rock so it's nice and secure. See, I can't pull it off. So sea stars like to eat mussels. That's why they hang out just below where the mussels are. How do they do it, Steph? So they have this really cool technique. They actually push their stomach outside of their body. They use their strong teeth to pull the shells apart on a mussel. And then they push their stomach in between those shells to digest all that goodness inside the mussel. So they're doing their digestion outside of their body. And then do they bring it back in their stomach? Well, they absorb all those nutrients and their stomach goes back inside their body when they're ready to move on to their next meal. Whoa! Step, check it out. I found what I was looking for. I found some anemones. And I also learned that when they're exposed, so they're not covered by water, they curl up into their protective little structure and they kind of look like big drippy boogers. When they're submerged underwater, they're able to open up so that they can feed and thrive. Check them out. They're the coolest little tentacle guys ever. I also learned that these guys are predators. So they eat things. So the way that they do it, all of their little tentacles have these stinging features to them. And so they're able to sting their prey, paralyze it, and bring it into their stomach. So they'll bring it into their little tube structure digest it, and then spit out the stuff that they don't want. Hey Steph, what's a bivalve? A bivalve? Well, bivalve, let's dissect that word. Bi means to, and valve is Latin for shell. So mussels have two shells, so they're bivalves. Mussels are filter feeders, so when the tide is high and they're covered in water, that's when they eat. They'll open up their shells, and they'll be able to pull water in through their body and so that flow of water is going to carry in small little things like plankton that they can eat. Uh, Steph, what you doing there? I'm pretending to be a barnacle. Why? What, what, what do you That's mean? What barnacles eat. So barnacles are kind of like mussels because they filter feed, but they do it in a different way. Barnacles are cousins of crabs. Think of crabs, they have legs. Well, if you glued a crab barnacle to a rock head first, its legs would be sticking up. And that's what a barnacle is, really. It's glued its head to the rock, its legs stick up, and it uses those legs like a net to catch food out of the water. Cool! Alright, Steph, I know that both of these organisms are barnacles, but uh, what's what? So this is a gooseneck barnacle, and this is a kind of acorn barnacle. Cool. So do they both kind of do the same thing? They just look different? Kind of, yeah. They both have the same evolutionary history and basic structure. So they both uh, glue their cells head first to the rock and use their legs, their leg structures to catch the food. Um, but they clearly look different. Oh, man. Check out this sweet tide pool that has captured a few critters during the low tide. Can you guys see those round purplish shells moving? Inside those shells are hermit crabs, and these guys are pretty amazing. So to protect themselves from the harsh intertidal environment, they actually arm their bodies with these protective shields that were created by other species. And the shells in which these hermit crabs are occupying were actually created by black turban snails. And so as the hermit crabs grow in size over time, they'll abandon the shell and find a new, larger one. Did you guys happen to notice any other living things caught in this tide pool? They're being extremely still and are quite well camouflaged. Take another look. Can you see the three fish? Those are sculpins. These sculpins are very well adapted to living in intertidal tide pools. They're pretty good at handling the higher temperatures and the low oxygen conditions of a tide pool at low tide. So don't worry, when the tide comes back in, they'll be free to swim away again. Has anyone here ever flipped over a rock and seen these little guys crawling around? So this is a shore crab, and shore crabs are one of our mobile intertidal species that can move between the different zones. And these guys have exoskeletons protecting their soft bodies from those rough wave action. 
And they also hide from the harsh intertidal conditions by bunkering down and keeping cover under rocks and in crevices. Have you guys ever seen this seaweed before? What does it look like to you? We call this feather boa kelp. You'll find it in the low tide zone. A variety of different seaweeds occupy this zone. This next one is called sea lettuce. Look how vibrant of a green it is. Seaweeds have adapted to be able to lose 90% of their water. Once the tides come back in, they quickly reabsorb the water and continue to thrive. Huh. Wonder what my friend Mark's doing. Hey, Mark. Oh, hey, Taylor. So what you doing out here today, Mark? Well, Taylor, I'll tell you. Coming down to the beach at low tide is pretty much my favorite place. What's so cool about the intertidal zone, Mark? Well, the thing that I like about the intertidal is it gives you a chance to kind of walk around under the ocean. So the intertidal area is the part of the beach that gets covered by water on a high tide, totally exposed on a low tide. So when you come down to the beach on a low tide, and you get down close to the water level, you're basically looking at a whole ecosystem, all these different habitats that are under the water. Check out these anemones, for example. So these are all aggregating anemones. They just look like a weird little brain. But if you were to come down and you were to see them under the water, you'd see that they've got their tentacles out. Here's a different kind of anem ane anemone. It's not an enemy. It's not your enemy, it's an anemone. So you can imagine that all of these life forms, all of these creatures, when they're out of the water, they have to basically behave in a completely different way. So look at these anemones here. These are all aggregating anemones. And you can see they kind of look like a wrinkled brain. They're all sort of sucked up so they can conserve water and protect themselves. But look at this guy. He's still under the water. This is a different species. This is called a giant green anemone. And you can see he's still got his tentacles out. He's still hunting for food. So here's actually an aggregating anemone and he's still got his tentacles out too. But these ones out of the water, they're basically in like protect mode. All right, Mark, let's go find some cool stuff in the intertidal. Well, we don't have to go far because everything's cool in the intertidal. Let's just see what's under this rock. Whoa, look at all these little crabs. Pretty much any rock that you're gonna pick up is gonna be hiding all kinds of different creatures. So here we've got probably about a dozen little crabs. Let's pick another rock. Okay, what about this one? Whoa! This is a different type of crab. This is like a kelp crab. Isn't he beautiful? So when these guys get bigger, they're actually gonna move out into a more subtitle habitat and they're perfectly camouflaged on strands of kelp. Okay, go back to your home. Oh, here's something else. Look, this is the this is the really cool thing about animals living in this kind of habitat. They're perfectly camouflaged. Do you see what this is right here? It's actually a fish. This is a little gunnel, and it's perfectly camouflaged. It looks exactly like a little piece of seaweed. You see it there? So this is like a, a fish that lives in the intertidal zone. I'm gonna try and really gently pick them up and put them in this shell here. We really wanna be gentle, gentle, gentle when we're looking at creatures in the intertidal. And we have to respect the fact that we are disturbing them a little bit. So here he is, he's in the water. You see how beautiful that guy is? And he looks exactly like a little piece of seaweed. So they're not really eels, but they kinda of look like eels. Gorgeous. Okay, let's check out this rock. That's a big gunnel. Do you see him here? You see how he's hiding under the seaweed? I'm gonna just really gently try to bring him to the surface. I'm just using one finger here. Do you see how big that guy is? So these fish, obviously they need to be in the water, but they can also kind of crawl around through the rocks, no problem. You see him here? He's so camouflaged. Oh, hello you beauty. 
Look at that beautiful pattern on his face. So these guys can actually crawl around in the intertidal. Whoop. There he goes. Back to your watery home, my gigantic friend. Okay, third time's the charm. Whoa! Whoa, Mark! So this is a this is a really cool little find. Here's a sea star, and he's clutching his own rocks. He's doing some rock lifting of his own. Okay, we'll be really gentle, and we'll put this back where we got it, and we'll make sure that we're not crushing anybody. Hey, Mark, this crab over here isn't even hiding. Au contraire, mon frere. He's hiding in plain sight. He's got such perfect camouflage. He looks exactly like a rock. All right, Mark, another day, another rock. What do we got? Here, I'm going to use a, a shell to gently pick this guy up here. Look at that. Oops, he's darting away. Look at this shrimp. Look how camouflaged this guy. Oops, he's darting away again. He's a darter. That's it. He, oh, here he is. Oh, there. bigger shell. Nice. All right. Whoa. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll keep him in the water. So you can see that one kind of, whoa, he's almost transparent. One of the kind of common themes here is camouflage, right? The intertidal is a zone of kind of constant conflict. Everything is trying to eat everything else and everything is afraid of being eaten. Low tide, you're exposed. Birds, small mammals are coming out. Bears are flipping over rocks and they'll lick you right up. The water comes up, all of a sudden you gotta worry for little fish or bigger crabs or whatever. This is one of the kind of most dynamic and terrifying places to make a living. And so all of the animals that live here have adapted to protect themselves as best they can and then also kind of maximize their success as predators. And so you see a lot of really, really, really amazing camouflage in the marine environment and in the, in the, in the intertidal zone. Wow, I can't believe how many different types of seaweed are out here. Oh, seriously. Intertidal area is the best to come and learn your seaweeds. They're actually really cool. Seaweeds are an amazing, amazing, amazing group of organisms. We live in an area with super high diversity and the best time and the best place to come and learn seaweeds is a nice beach like this on a low tide. You get so many different kinds and they're all on display. Yeah, this stuff right here looks so cool, Mark. What kind of seaweed is this? So actually, Taylor, this isn't a seaweed. This is actually a flowering plant. It's called surf grass and it's one of the very, very few species of actual plants that have adapted for life in the ocean. Whoa, a flowering plant underwater? You better believe it, baby. Oh, Mark, I hate when people leave garbage on the beach. Are you talking about this little guy? Yeah. This isn't garbage. This is something a lot cooler. This is basically, it feels kind of like plastic or it almost looks like concrete, but this is a moon snail egg case. This is basically like one of the coolest things ever. So moon snails are these big, huge, predatory snails. They lurk around in sandy substrates. They come out, they hunt all kinds of food in the intertidal, and this is how they reproduce. They reproduce sexually in the intertidal area, and then the female basically pumps out thousands and thousands and thousands of eggs, and she encases them in this like sand gelatin matrix. Whoa! So this is all one big mass of eggs. You see these all over, but they're not garbage. So we'll put it back here, and we'll let these little eggs continue to develop. Did you know moon snails can live to be like 14, 15 years old? It's crazy. So one of the things that I find fascinating about the intertidal is when you come down here and you start exploring, you kind of invariably get down on your hands and knees, and it's a very micro world. It's a very small world, and it's easy to lose yourself. And then you stand up, and you look around, and you realize, that the intertidal is where the whole ocean, the largest ecosystem on earth, meets all of the land. In this case, this, this huge massive forest. And basically the intertidal area, even though it seems really big when you're zoomed in on whatever little thing you're examining, it's just like a really narrow band. You know, like this whole beach, this whole intertidal area, is less than 200 meters wide and maybe a few hundred meters long. 
but you have to imagine this habitat stretches down every single coastline in the world and in that narrow band you have an entire world you know it's it's just the, the coolest place to come and explore and it's it's magical i love it and we're so lucky to have places like this right in our backyards wow mark thanks for that great lesson we'll see you around town yeah, for sure, Taylor. Sorry if I was a little crabby today. <laughs> Here oh. I go, check this out. This is a moon snail shell. So we got a shell growing on a shell. Growing on the other shell is a bunch of seaweed. And I guarantee you, if we could put this under the scope, we'd find other stuff living in and amongst all the algae on that other shell. There's literally nothing in the intertidal that doesn't have many layers of life living on it. All right, everybody, that is it for today. I hope you learned some cool new facts about our intertidal zone that we have here on the coast. Next week, we are going to go off a little bit deeper into the ocean explore, um, some more things that there is out there. So remember that our Rain Coast Challenge is up online. Go for it, go do it, get out and explore and see what you can see out there, guys. Hopefully you can see some of those awesome organisms that we were so lucky to see today. We wanted to thank you for joining us today and we'll see you next week. Take care.